afternoon and welcome to MedCity Invest Precision Medicine. I'm Stephanie Baum, Director of Special Projects with MedCity News. Before we get started, I'd like to just give you an overview of MedCity News. Founded in late 2008, MedCity News covers innovation in life sciences and healthcare. We cover biopharma, digital health, medical devices, diagnostics, as well as hospitals and payers in the context of the industry's overall transformation. We host conferences focusing on investment, population health, digital health, and patient engagement, in addition to precision medicine. We accept outside content through our MedCity Influencers Program. We also offer a program geared to startups called Med Citizens, in which startups gain editorial and event benefits. If you'd like to know more about these programs, you can contact me at sbaummedcitynews.com. We also have a program called MedCity Pivot Podcast. You can listen to our episodes that are on, on our website and you can contact our editor-in-chief, Arn Doty Parmar, for more information about it at aparmar at medcitynews.com. Thank you to our sponsors, Independence Blue Cross, the leading healthcare insurance organization in Southeastern Pennsylvania and a longtime sponsor of MedCity Events. Thanks also to our sponsor, JPOD at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you to our partners, the University City Science Center, MHIN, Health Wildcatters, Startup Health, and Argo Pond Consulting. And now for our panel, AI Meets Drug Development. Our moderator for this panel is Dr. David Shaywitz, founder of Astounding Health Tech a Silicon Valley-based advisory service that provides pragmatic digital thought partnership to senior R&D leaders. David is a summa cum laude graduate of Harvard College. He studied biochemical sciences, continued his training as a physician scientist, pursuing his MD through the Harvard Medical School MIT program in health science and technology, and his PhD through the Department of Biology at MIT. He continued his training in internal medicine and endocrinology, was at MGH and is postdoc in the Melton Lab at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. He then left academia for industry, working first at Merck, Boston Consulting Group, and TheraVance. Another member of the panel is Lena Nielsen, Vice President of Product at Recursion. In her role, she spans data science, machine learning, engineering, and innovation biology. Previously, she was the COO of Analytic and Innovation Director at the University of California, Berkeley, where she helped spin out social impact technologies and developed entrepreneurial programs for students. She conceptualized and helped launch Hardware X, a peer-reviewed journal for open source hardware that is hosted by Elsevier. Lena has been recognized on MIT Technology Review's TR35 annual list of the world's top innovators, her writings on open science, social impact technologies, and gender and tech have been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, Science, and Make magazine. Lena also has a PhD in biomedical engineering from the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Another member of the panel is Panna Sharma, the president, CEO, and board member of Lantern Pharma, a clinical stage oncology biotech using AI and genomics to innovate the rescue, revitalization, and development of precision cancer therapeutics. As CEO, Panna is responsible for developing Lantern's strategic vision and working closely with the venture investors to raise capital that will place the company at the forefront of using AI and genomics in developing its pipeline of precision therapies. Panna attended Boston University in the University Professors Program, having focused his studies on philosophy of science neural networks and AI. And now welcome to the panel. Great, thanks Steph. Um, I, I am delighted to be here today and especially delighted to be joined by uh, two fantastic uh, guests, uh, Lena Nilsson, the VP of Product at Recursion and Pana Sharma, the uh, CEO of Lantern Pharma. So welcome to each of you. Uh, thanks, thanks, I appreciate it. So um, let me start with just a couple of words of uh, context about these companies and then we'll really get going. So uh, Recursion envisions itself as creating the next generation FIPCO, fully integrated pharmaceutical company, starting with basic research and powered by AI and uh, automated experimentation. It's based in Salt Lake City, Utah, venture backed, privately held with uh, last time I read a remarkable estimated valuation. It's officially a unicorn 
an estimated valuation of about a billion dollars and around 200 employees, uh, last I checked. Lantern's focus is in a sense more explicitly targeted or strategic. They're seeking to identify promising drugs that have already been in clinical studies and have failed on efficacy because they may not have been tried in the ideal indication. By matching them up with uh, the already, by matching up the already developed medicine with a, a more suitable indication, Lantern hopes to rapidly unlock and capture the value. Lantern is based in Dallas, publicly traded on the NASDAQ with a marketed cap uh, of this morning of uh, around $95 million, 95, uh, yeah, $95 million. And um, they have something like uh, 14 employees. So um, welcome, you guys. Thanks. Thank you. So, Pana, let's start with you. Um, can you introduce yourself uh, by first by briefly sketching uh, your own journey, uh, how you wound up where you are, and how this relates to the mission of your company? Yeah, sure. Absolutely, David. Um, as you know, we my own journey started in biotech um, as a CEO in a biotech with a company called Cancer Genetics. And there I learned a lot about um, the clinical trial process and in recruiting scientists and team members to kind of work at this intersection of genomics and, and oncology. Uh, but before that, I was a banker and consultant, mostly focused on life sciences and biotech. And part of my journey was really moving away from being in the service industry to trying to build things. And I had some mentors um, that, you know, always would take me aside and say, you know, you really can't, you really can't or shouldn't be a consultant and, um, you know, tell others what to do. You really should take the helm at some of these companies or start a company and, and try to make a difference. And so um, I had the opportunity to do that back starting in 2013 with my first biotech that I was CEO of. And I really enjoyed the experience and we made an impact on a lot of lives. And, and um, when I was looking at my next adventure, I really wanted to focus on cancer again, uh, but knew at the time that the way to develop drugs was changing rapidly. And I saw it in my own personal experience with the pharmas and biotechs we worked with. And when I was presented with the opportunity from our VCs at BIOS and GPG Ventures, it seemed to really fit perfectly with kind of my background, but where my intellectual and personal interests were and with the ability to kind of grow and manage a team over again. So I joined Lantern about a little over two years ago, two and a half years, about two, almost two and a half years now. And um, I've enjoyed that journey a lot. Wow, and, and, and that relates to uh, what Lantern, could you then uh, um, kind of explain how uh, the sort of the updated view of the future of the industry relates to what, what Lantern's mission is? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, what drew me really to um, the mission was to drive these therapeutics to patients faster uh, with decreased cost and increased ability to personalize. And so the drug costs, especially in cancer, are just astronomical. And the only way to change it isn't just to reduce drug pricing when people beat up on pricing, but really you have to go back and change the risk and change the cost of development. And AI has done that and data approaches have done that in other industries tremendously. They've crushed product cycle development timelines and changed cost and everything from transportation to finance to everything else. And so now drug development is one of the last industries. And so, um, you know, our mission is to bring you know, really promising compounds to patients to personalize treatment at significantly reduced cost. And so, you know, data approaches are central to making this happen. Terrific. Um, so Lena, uh, this must uh, resonate in a large part with you. Um, love to hear about your journey and how it relates to uh, what, what uh, Recursion is up to. For sure. Uh, I used to be the innovation director at the University of California, Berkeley. That was all about spinning out new technologies uh, with potential for social impact. And I think one thread that is common with recursion that a lot of that work was in combination of engineering hardware, machine learning, and science applications or science tools. Um, there, one of the big flagship projects were around, was around automated diagnostics for tuberculosis. But I think those three ingredients stay true at the core of what makes recursion's approach successful. And my belief in those tools coming together is really a big part of how I eventually ended up at recursion. 
Um, and second at University of California, Berkeley, I worked a lot on around open science. And that I think is another thread, this kind of belief at recursion of the industry making impact with these new tools. Um, and maybe one specific example is that we've released a series of massive data sets around the work we do, both the raw, da raw data and the um, final machine learning analysis we have done. So kind of that belief in an approach uh, even though we're a private company, maybe it's another thread as far as you, you're pulling on on the approach and the belief. You know, that's interesting. As far as AI goes, different companies have, ta tech companies have kind of seemed to have very different approaches. I think of Google as getting some of the best talent because they've been really, at least their reputation is they're uh, extraordinarily open. I would sort of the opposite of that would be companies like uh, Apple would be sort of the opposite extreme by reputation uh, and Amazon. Um, at least by reputation, or but particularly Apple's like known to be really, really sort of shut down. Um, and then for a while, I had trouble getting good people because people like the idea of being in the open community. It sounds like you're in, with a lot of intentionality. You're kind of trying to pursue the Google model. Is that is that right? That's right. I mean, we, we definitely explicitly looked at what other companies are doing when it hasn't hasn't worked, and we do see a hiring and kind of people seeing that work as as one. A uh, big benefit for us as a company. A second one is that there's a lot of companies out there saying they're doing AI and they aren't really. And this is really putting it out there, right? Like this is the this is really hard proof. Literally hundreds of thousands of images uh, across various data sets on diseases and applications we work with, along with our machine learning features and analysis, right? Like and you must do this. You must do this with a sense of. You know, I can imagine one of the reasons that there's always, uh, I feel like this topic comes up so frequently, of a dilemma of what to share, what not to, is a concern of giving away competitive secrets or is the secret sauce. And particularly in pharma, that's um, actually, I would say, not just in pharma, in medical research, because um, uh, sort of virtu virtuosity aside, academics are as loath to share as anybody else, often more so. Um, the but the, uh, you know, in terms of being able to, to sort of do that, it sounds like you're not worried that you're giving away somehow competitive secrets. Is that right? <laughs> well, we worry about that too, right? There's definitely cost. And we know there are other companies using our data sets, right? Like that is real. But we believe that on the whole, this is good for us. And it's good for the industry. And, and maybe in particular within the industry, it's good for the wave of machine learning within pharma and us collectively understanding what is possible and what isn't. So and then are you arguably a company like, uh, so Pana, you're in a situation which may be on the other side of this in that you're really having the opportunity to, you, a lot of your, I understand that you generate some of your own data, but you had a chance to really get ahead, you know, to, to powerfully leverage the remarkable amount of existing data that are out there. Is that correct? Yeah. So yeah, we, there's a lot, as you know, there's a lot of data and it's exploding every day, um, especially in cancer data sets or in certain drug classes. So we do have a little bit of a jump start that we can go back and look at the data from historical drug classes of interest, the drug of interest if it was developed, um, as well as different cancers that we're looking at. But we generate a remarkable amount of our own data through sequencing campaigns, drug sensitivity studies, and functional assays that um, further refine and enrich the uh, target hypothesis that we have. And so, David, one, two of our drugs are um, definitely repurposed, um, sorry, uh, rescued, that they failed prior trials. Uh, but one of them is a de novo new drug. And that drug was built on the back of um, really looking very closely at a drug that had a lot of promise, but you know, uh, wasn't having the effects in the clinical setting. And so we went back to the drawing board and actually used a combination of different models, both um, redesigning the drug based on target interaction, but also then on refining the approach of which um, biomarkers were most, um, you know, most involved in its functionality, both in terms of transforming the prodrug to an active metabolite and also where the metabolite interacted with the uh, nucleotide excision repair spot. And so that was actually where that was really, really interesting because I came into the company in the middle of trying to bring all these different avenues of machine learning and data approach to actually design a whole new drug. And um, so two of our programs are rescue and one is kind of inspired by an analog, but a totally new compound, you know, built for purpose. I wanted to take just half a minute because one of the things that I've heard you discuss 
um, which I think is so helpful for people who are listening to get a sense because, you know, people are like, well, repurposing, and, you know, and what actually is, is interesting is in the history until very recently, so many things and almost every neurodrug came was based on a chance observation. Um, uh, there's a terrific book called Happy Accidents that actually details a lot of this. Um, but, it, but could you go through it just briefly because it's so relevant. Um, the exam, uh, your, uh, the sort of prismatic example of cell gene as um, mm -hmm. the origins of this you know, massively successful now oncology company. And because it's true, you know, from, um, from Summit, New Jersey, uh, how yeah, it began. You must have listened to my, to my, uh, to an interview, right? Or a podcast I did on that. That's a great example. Well, you know, you're, you're out, out uh, you and me are both out there. So it's a privilege to have the opportunity. Yes. But yeah, that's a, yeah. So let me, for the audience, so there is rescue and rescue really means um, or revitalize. Some people use that term, but that really means where a drug has failed, you know, a phase two or phase three trial where it didn't meet the primary or secondary endpoints so that it could actually be a commercially available therapeutic. So those are typically, you know, so that is a failed or sometimes it gets abandoned um, also because people don't have enough comfort where it, will, where it will work or how it'll work. So those are really perfect targets for us. And there are about 300 that we internally are really modeling um, and looking at. Uh, and there's a universe of about 6,000, but we've narrowed it down to 300 that we're interested in. Now, um, repurpose is a drug that has actually made it across the finish line and is used in a particular indication. Um, and then either because of, uh, you know, looking at pathways, looking at transcription factors, looking at, you know, different ways a drug can work, looking at mechanistic studies, um, then it's repurposed and it could be repurposed in the same form. It could be repurposed in a powder form and a lozenge form and an injectable form. Um, so the delivery could be changed. Uh, so we don't do repurpose. Repurpose is a very specific pathway called 505B2. Um, and we are focused more on rescue than on repurpose right now. Um, and the great example for a little bit of a hybrid story is, is in fact the cell gene story that you were talking about. I mean, it is, this is a remarkable drug that they've had, uh, uh, linalamide, which has changed the lives of thousands, tens of thousands of multiple myeloma patients, totally changed their life. Um, but that drug came from a failed drug, a drug that was pulled from the market, thalidomide. It was actually used to treat um, morning sickness and nausea in pregnant women. And um, it caused thousands and thousands of birth defects because of the mechanism um, really targeted certain clonal cell populations that caused you know, uh, just a massive amount of damage to these newborn babies, um, including death, including long-term permanent disabilities. So the drug was pulled. Um, and in fact, the, a lot of the FDA's current safety you know, protocols are driven because of that, because that drug never made it to the US. And so Although ironically, it was held up for a different reason, not for that reason, but it's, yeah. it's yeah, yeah. And so they, you know, some, when people were looking at this drug, some you know, geniuses said, you know what, this is a really interesting drug because perhaps we can treat leprosy you know, an untreatable disease. And you know, because it worked on certain clonal cell populations, they made the, the leap in their own mind, their own intellectual mind to say, let's try this in leprosy. Worked in leprosy um, and it was under a really strict protocol that was uh, given Yeah, out. that they patented a huge amount of the IP that was responsible for their initial success was actually the incredible, very deliberate way that patients were enrolled in it yes. because yeah. absolutely positively, not like, oh, do you think maybe you're pregnant? No, okay, we believe you. It was like, I mean, I don't even know about like how that, you know, but it was, it was really um, extraordinarily um, robust, that, that part of it. And that was a key part of um, the uh, enrollment and the relevant IP. Yeah, and very strict protocols you mentioned and, and became part of, uh, you know, that was Telgen's real first commercial success. And again, that was then um, repurposed um, so the drug was initially rescued and then now it's repurposed from, uh, leprosy to multiple myeloma again. Because so I think that's, I want to, I want to bring Lena into this. I think that that's such an interesting example where here's something it was developed for one reason. It had a real problem. It was then, but it, but it clearly had a huge amount of potential. And once that was recognized and appropriately managed the underlying intrinsic value of the compound, and then even more so the next generation one that didn't have some of the original liabilities was really captured. 
So Lena, help us understand um, some of what recursion is, is, is after and what are some examples of their sort of the green shoots, the early signs of success that I know you guys have achieved. Yeah. Help sure. us like walk through your approach, how you think about it and what are uh, some examples of signs that your massively big bet on AI and automated experimentation is working. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the kind of foundational starting point of our uh, discovery process is using phenomics. So microscopy images of human cells that either have or have not been exposed to various compounds, including repurposing drugs or part of our portfolio. Um, and uh, doing that across millions of examples every week, analyzing that automatically with machine learning using a, a specific category of technique called representation learning then will help us zero in out of these millions of examples on the most interesting and the, the ones that show the highest degree of rescue in a cellular model to then follow up on um, both with traditional bench science approaches, in vivo approaches, and other um, uh, more bespoke machine learning approaches at recursion. And so with this approach, since the company was founded in 2013, and maybe the last three or four years, she'll have been operating at this larger scale, doubling each year to, to the numbers I, I just mentioned um, earlier this year. Uh, we have four compounds in, uh, in human clinical trials. So having gone through kind of the more traditional uh, IND enabling late stage studies uh, to get to that point. So most of those are in rare disease, genetic rare disease repurposing. Uh, and those are kind of our uh, proof points for this approach working, I would say. And how did you come across, like, how did you land on those um, molecules? Because ultimately the, the problem with even some of the most attractive platforms is that it's so hard to have evaluation, not just uh, be, be pegged to the um, leading candidate. Now, when you guys, you, you guys really kind of managed not to necessarily be in that. I think there's a lot of value clearly attributable to the platform itself, where, you know, which has clearly been a priority. Um, but ultimately it's gonna be judged on, do you make medicines that are uh, impactful? How have your, your the, the ones that are kind of front running, how are, uh, how, how did you land on those? Yeah, so we'll screen uh, libraries. The, the way we think about the platform is screening different types of libraries of compounds, depending on the approach, as well as what we call scientific modules of ways that we induce disease, whether that's through CRISPR or some other technique we have in-house, for example, for infectious disease or inflammation or oncology. And so uh, we will focus on the library, whether it's a repurposed library or a specific type of uh, library for new chemical entities and, and chemical iteration in-house. Um, and the approach that recursion has taken up until today is really one of like massive brute force. So we're not mm -hmm. steering in on specific compounds early on, but operating at just these um, scales that to, to that might feel unbelievable for those of us that have worked on the lab bench <laughs> early on and prepared your own multi-well plates, um, the kind of scales you can do obviously with a fully- I mean, it really, you're trying, you know, what's so interesting is what people, one of the things that com comes up in so many of my conversations is biologists and computer scientists have a completely different view of big data. You know, someone says, oh, we have like a hundred people in our study. That, that, that's a lot or a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And then I was talking to even people who are like, oh, you know, the, even if you look at the global population of the world and then for people who are really trying to learn, you know, with AI, uh, you know, kind of develop these systems, they're like, eh. you know, like, you know, sort of like rank, like you guys are not even rank amateurs, you know, like in order to get some of the real value, the, the scale that they really think you start to need for some applications is just extraordinary, but it sounds like what you got, what re re recursion is doing is focusing, you know, AI is data driven and you guys are trying to generate the extraordinarily robust, high quality, high volume data that you need to empower, to drive the AI. Is that fair? Yeah, that's, that's definitely fair. So there's lots of work around data relatability, data robustness, repeatability, reagent control, et cetera. In fact, you know, one often talks about like there's the machine learning algorithms that, that help us find these compounds that I just mentioned, but there's actually a whole slew of data science and analysis techniques to just make sure you have the high quality data to be able to do that final step. And that's a massive part of, of making it work. 
and maybe if I can throw in another quote just around the data quantities. Um, the last, I think, public mm. numbers we have is we have five petabytes of data. And just to wrap your mind around how much that really is, you know, if I were to make a Netflix movie that had five petabytes of data, that'd be a movie that you would watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year for 200 years. I mean, it's a lot. Right. <laughs> and, and, uh, it, and, and part of the advantage that machine learning gives us, it's not just kind of the accuracy, the able, ability to see nuance that you couldn't with a human eye to look at the microscopy images, but also the fact that it wouldn't be humanly possible, right, to go through those kind of data quantities. And maybe the final point before I, I, I let you talk no, please. is, you know, it's a very targeted problem. And so that's maybe another interesting point, right? It's not trying, it, we found a very targeted place where machine learning can have a huge impact, right? It, it's not solving all the things in this algorithm example. It's something very specific that we can do again and again for great value. And uh, I, I think it's so important. And I'm, I'm also really keen to get into um, but uh, Bob, I want I want to go to uh, uh, to to uh, Pana now. But um, I, I want to. We will come back just just uh, to talk about how you're integrating the, the the data science excellence with what I know because I've worked with actually some of the folks um, before they were drawn there uh, on um, on sort of almost more the traditional pharma uh, experience and sort of all of that latent knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so uh, Pana, one of the, I would say maybe the, you know, I guess to pivot a little bit too. So we discussed some of the opportunities about data and AI um, and about the application of AI to pharma, but I, maybe to talk even about some of the limitations. Um, and, you know, we're, everyone's always talking about how, you know, the data and the data quantity, but there's also issues of, um, uh, there are issues about data quantity and data quality. And so yeah. um, for, for the work that you do, um, uh, I guess maybe I mean, to talk about both of them. So on the quantity side, you really think that there's enough data, um, you know, to to make the decisions to drive the AI that you need for for what you're trying to do. And on the quality side, I'm really interested in your view of the uh, you know garbage in garbage out problem and how you're trying to think about that. I mean, recursion in a sense, what they've just said is well, they're focused, they're so aware of this, they're trying to create a. Uh, trying to clean this up for us, Steph here, um, uh, uh, a stuffed ton of data and to try to, um, you know, in, 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 on the very early side and to, you know, in a very, it's still a really reduced system uh, and to, you know, to try to gain essentially very precise insights, but in a very reduced system. But almost intrinsically, at least a lot of what you're doing for the repurposing um, is looking at almost kind of more human level data, I would think. Um, or data where you're not going to have the kajillion data points that um, uh, you know that Lena is talking about, and a lot of the data that you're sort of talking about is, you know, I would think is going to be under you know different conditions, under inconsistent conditions, um, and I'm really curious what's your view of the quantity and quality of it, and how it impacts your ability to drive decisions from it. Um, yeah, it's a good question, David. Um... So I'll try not to bias you too much, but um, we're going after a very specific problem. So very different maybe from recursion's large scale brute force approach. We're going after specific problems to understand where a compound or a class of compounds will work or not work in cancers specifically. Um, so we are looking to determine signatures, whether they are genomic or proteomic or enzymatic that correlate to a heightened degree of sensitivity to a specific compound or a class of compounds. And so that specific problem allows us to iterate. So we don't really rely just purely again on public data or historical data. Um, one of the points that Lena made was about iteration. And so that rapid iteration is really key to our accelerated development. So something that would have taken a traditional pharma a year or two will take us several months instead because as we refine the hypothesis, we can go back and ask specific questions, do knock in or knock out type studies, um, look at you know, specifically engineered uh, models that examine that problem and then feed that data back into our system. So um, I think that garbage in, garbage out is a key issue, but because of iteration, you can refine hypotheses or toss them aside or continue to develop them but more importantly than just the, um, 
the data is really algorithms. You know, the algorithms, you know, there's, as Lena pointed out, there's no way that you could get a team of 10, 20, 100 people to iterate all the potential correlations across all these data sets. So a big part of what we do is that when we ingest data or generate data is clean it up and normalize it and tag it and try to give it quality scores. So every data set we have is a quality score. Um, and you're right, older data gets thrown out because machines were different. They modeled things differently. They had measurements for expression values and types of alt genomic alterations that weren't thought about say 12 years ago or 10 years ago that are looked at routinely now. So yeah, curating the data is a big part of what we do. I mean, it's- What's you know, interesting is when you talk to, so I mean, very publicly, like actually they've, um, Novartis, okay, um, obscure company in Cambridge and um, uh, yeah, Switzerland. They um, when when um, you know their, their whole they're, they're defining themselves as you know data driven medicines company, very ambitious around data science and really have been you know have, have exhibited a lot of leadership. And one of the challenges of being out in front is you know you also get some of the initial you know kind of you know, it's mm -hmm. very public and when thing and Voss has been amazing about describing his experience, and you know it's. Really difficult. I mean, he's he said this on on um, uh, on podcasts he's done. He's written this this nature uh, nature medicine, I think, or nature reviews drug discovery something earlier this summer, where they described some of their initial efforts and basically getting their hands on the data for some extraordinary like rudimentary stuff is is brutal. And um, any data scientist you talk to, Ron Hack, he'll tell you the same. Uh, he'll tell you the same thing, right? That it's all about the. Um, uh, the data curation, the cleaning, like 90, more than 90% of people's time is what's sometimes called data janitor, right? Is just sort of getting this stuff into shape so you can start to do the, the cool algorithm. So uh, That's right. Lena, is that your experience as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. But I think even um, adding maybe like there's these questions before, you know, is it quality or quantity, you know? Being crisp before you even decide you're going to use machine learning, what's the problem you're trying to solve, right? I mean, even at recursion, there's lots of things we do where there's no data science, right? It's it's other places where we innovate and, and try to be creative. We always try to stay to the places we think we have, like something special Com to bring. Competitive advantage. Yeah. Now, um, I wanted to to pivot briefly. I'm um, here. Oh, um, I know I have around um, 15 minutes, uh, 14 minutes to go. Um, was um, one of the you know challenges of applying data science to to drug discovery is that um, you know drug discovery involves you know there, there's analytics but there's a huge amount of, um, of innate or, or latent uh, experience and um, the, I, I've written this so this isn't just like I'm not that's the first time I'm sharing this with you um, Alina but the time where I started to take recursion seriously um, uh, for the first time wasn't all of this like cool algorithm and even all the fundraising, I mean, you know, like, you know, that, I thought that was great, but we see this. But when you, you know, you start to hire some of these people who I knew, um, and you know exactly who I'm thinking of, um, this guy from TheraVent specifically, where I used to work, um, who's a hardcore, you know, Clin Farm guy, super skeptical about like, knew anything, like, like was, was, was not bright, shiny object person. And, but you populated your organization with that, with people like that. So I'm wondering how have you, maybe you could explain how recur, and, and I thought, wow, that was really impressive, both that you had the, the foresight to recruit someone like that and that someone like that chose to come. I mean, I thought that was really, really, um, uh, so Sh Sharath is who we're thinking of, but, but many people like Sharath. Um, and of course, you know, so how did you think about, how have you thought about integrating data science but not, but also some of the, all the other skills that one needs um, to be a successful um, drug development company. Yeah, yeah, no, that's totally true. And, and even those of us who are more maybe on the tech side like me, I mean, I came to recursion having seen the impressive lineup on the other side. Um, the company now is about 35%, we might call it the technical side, engineering, mm -hmm. data science, machine learning, and-, and But unusually well integrated and- um, but yeah. I give Chris a huge amount of credit for that, but and, and the fact that he recruits people clearly like yourself who are uh, of, the, of of similar mindset. Yeah. But how have you thought about that? How 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 has it been so successful to the extent that you believe it has been? 
Yeah, it definitely, I think it has. I mean, it's hard. It's hard even at recursion. That's a hard problem everywhere, I think. It's something you, you can never stop focusing on, right? You can't take it for, for given. Uh, some of the things we do, if you just want to talk about kind of practical tactics, is things like set the company goals so that they don't easily divide like you see, between science and technology. But that combination is inherently in, in our year. Isn't that interesting? Goals. Another one is have people functionally work in pods where their goals are set, their, their sub-team goals, but that team might have two biologists, two data scientists, and three engineers, et cetera, so that in their day-to-day, -day, they sit that way, or the way we sit functionally within the company when we're not remote, when there's no right, pandemic, right, <laughs> right? That, that, you know, data scientists will have biologists row over so that that conversation is not something that just happens, you know. I think the concept of shared goals and, and the connectivity, I mean, that's something, one of the other, I think, really successful leaders in this space is uh, 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 Amy Abernathy, you know, um, from Duke, and oncologist at Duke and in Flatiron and now um, deputy uh, director at the FDA. But she, I was at, interviewing her as part of a panel uh, a couple of months ago. And that was what she kept coming back to is exactly the point you were just making about the idea of not just having, you know, you know we'll, have, so we'll have one of A and one of B and one of C, but the idea of, of, of really cultivating the best of those, uh, of that engagement and working towards shared goals. Um, Hanna, how have you thought about this? Um, I think it's the same thing, shared goals. We're in much smaller scope. So of course, but... almost everyone uh, is at the company because of um, a shared belief and kind of the mission or a desire to want to do inter interdisciplinary work. You know, the one kind of observation is that it, it seems to me and probably will continue to be true that a lot of the, um, you know, the molecular biologists and cancer research scientists are definitely of a different age group than the data science and machine learning people. So if I just say, let's take our molecular biologists and cancer researcher team, and like that average age probably is skewing closer to, I don't know, maybe mid forties. And if I take the machine learning and data science people, that average age is probably skewing toward maybe 30. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's probably just one observation. I mean, maybe that gets lost as we grow, but I, I don't that think That is so. an interesting ver a point about it too, because you, you tend to, th that almost can be missed. And there are these important, um, uh, you know, issues of, of, I mean, even just related to where people are in their own life development and yeah. what one thinks about, not every single time, but, you know, when one is 20 and 30 and 40 and 50, maybe, maybe one imagines uh, evolves. Um, so I think that that's really interesting. Now, um, how do you, you know, you, you've, you're obviously, you're, you, you're, you both interact extensively, your companies with um, the larger industry. I mean, that's a critical part of, of what you're doing, um, uh, particularly on the exit side, I'm sure. I mean, but actually for both where you get the compounds from in many cases, um, Pana, and then for both of you, um, uh, you know, I know that um, uh, recursion has a number of engagements. How have you seen pharma approaching data science, uh, ap approaching you know, data science and AI, all this, on the one hand, they're like, oh, digital transformation. Yeah, we're, we're so in digital transformation. Yeah, like we're all about that. On the other hand, you know, it's, uh, so many things have remained business as usual. So where, where are they in um, exactly, like, like I think you both pointed out, um, every other industry, I mean, it's become almost a truism. You know, it's like, yeah, you can bank at home. You can, you know, you were, you were talking about Netflix earlier. And then, you know, pharma um, is, uh, you know, uh, doesn't quite feel like it's embraced the, the full potential of a, di of a digital yet. Um, how, is that, how is that going? Let, let, let's start, uh, Lena, with you from each of your perspectives. Where do you see pharma is on their um, data and digital journey? Um, I, I mean, I think in some ways what small companies are doing, I think new players, it, you know, we have some advantages, right? Um, I think both you and I have written about this. Uh, things like we're digital natives. Our data is already in one place where it can be related. Our ability to balance tech and science, like we just talked about, is intrinsically easier. Yeah, you get to, I mean, you create the culture you want to have. You, you sort of do it right from the ground up. But there, on the other hand, there are all these established relationships and all of this in, you know, uh, complexity of making and, and, and selling uh, new medicines yeah. that uh, 
large companies intrinsically have, which are a lot for a small company, even with you know billion dollars to or billion dollar valuation to to actually acquire. I was going to say exactly that too, right? Pfizer was founded in 1849, American in 1899. They've learned a lot, right? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> we're not going to catch up on that expertise, right? But it, it, even, you know, even within the machine learning part, I think there are specific problems where the big pharma companies are going to be better positioned. So I wouldn't even say like, oh, the small agile companies, we're going to do all the machine learning. Like over time, they're going to learn too, like buyer, do you think so? Like, do you think they're going to be, I mean, I'm actually curious about this. Um, yeah. Are they going to be able to retrofit um, with, with this stuff? Or is it always going to be just such like an awkward fit? And in other words, is the future going to be Novartis figuring out how to do digital? Or is the future going to be, and I know it doesn't have to be either or, but is the future going to be someone like Recursion and, um, or others, um, you know, in, in, in the context of a larger ecosystem? Um, basically becoming the new Novartisism works. <laughs> I mean- Like, like in 10 years or 20 years, is the next, is the next Merck, Merck and Novartis gonna be in Citro and Recursion? <laughs> I mean, I, I am at Recursion, so obviously that's where I'm, I'm placing my bet in a way. But, you know, I'm, I think there's gonna be also some big pharma company that manages to make the different decision in a different way with a different set of insights than recursion, right? So. Very interesting. Pano, how are you seeing it? Uh, I think some aspects of pharma are doing digital really well, but the challenge really is for them to integrate it into their product development and early research work. And that is not being done. It's still very siloed. Hear the data guys and the machine learning guys, and they get out, get to write papers and collect a bunch of data, and hear the scientists and biologists and clinical insight people, and um, the two don't are not don't have that level of mixture that's required to you know for us to grow. We have to do it. We don't have a choice. I mean, we're purpose built around yeah. specific programs and specific compounds, and I can't go spend five million dollars on preclinical work, and so I've got to get it out of Machine learning. I think that's such an interesting observation because I think that that's, I mean, I, I think we've all maybe it sounds like discussed and written about that. The idea of how the way I try to put it is um, it's it, many of the pharma companies, it still feels sort of like this exotic group that you sort of parade out for innovation day and, you know, yeah. uh, you know tell your board, oh, yeah, you know, I'm out. We're, we're doing this great deal with Stanford, with whoever. And, you know, um, I mean, on the other hand, I, I really do feel like people like Voss and others, as you point out, are serious about this. So ending- um, I don't think it also minutes, is that these big farmers, yeah. uh, first and foremost, have to be stewards of their existing revenue streams. And so mm -hmm. unless you can attach your data and machine learning approaches to new, new meaningful revenue streams, it becomes really challenging, whether you're um, at Pfizer or Novartis, to say, hey, we're going to bet the farm on these approaches because they- you know, I think the I think data driven machine learning approaches will be part and parcel of the future of pharma, but how they get there is unclear. And so I think you know, big pharma That's so interesting has to be a steward of their existing revenue stream, which is not AI enabled. You know, so until that happens, which will take a decade, um, it'll be challenging to see that totally. So um, I, I insist, um, you know. One of the things, as you can see, uh, being here in uh, the Bay Area, uh, I'm obliged to end on a positive note. Um, so um, uh, positive and hopeful. Uh, what, are, what is the one thing you're each most excited about regarding um, uh, AI and the future of uh, uh, drug discovery and uh, biopharmaceuticals? Uh, Lena, maybe we'll start with you. Sorry. I am uh, really excited well, You're about such a positive person. There must be so much here. <laughs> There's so much. Of, yeah, yeah. I mean, being positive is also, I think, a life strategy, right? Uh, <laughs> but I think one thing- Especially now, right? Yeah. One thing is uh, uh, what we at Recursion call the map of biology. Uh, there are other companies doing similar things here. This idea of kind of at its first state, which machine learning can get you, whether you're in fintech or internet or, or medicine, is just this big scale brute force, right? But once you begin to understand the noise in your data and, and, and the nuance of your data, being able to relate that across um, uh, large use cases can kind of get you to this next level of insight. And we're beginning to scratch the surface on that. And I'm excited to be able to talk about it more, but I think that's, um, 
a really powerful thing that if you look at like much longer time horizons. Uh, you really do have, it's funny because a lot of times people are viewing like AI as this, oh, this like hot thing now, but for, it really sounds like you're really excited about how it's setting you up on this ter terrific trajectory. Pana, let's give you the last word. Sure, I, the things that excite me the most is the ability to totally change the cost of developing new medicines. Uh, it shouldn't be a billion to three billion. I think it's in the future. That's not sustainable. And uh, uh, yeah, I think zeros are going to be taken off. And I think your ability to personalize therapies are going to uh, go through the roof over the next 20 years. I think instead of having, you know, 90 drugs for cancer, you're going to have hopefully 900 or 9,000 and they're going to cost, you know, one tenth of what it costs today to, to develop them. Um, so that's, you know, large scale. That's, that's the thing I'm most excited about. But also yeah. kind of at a, at a nerd level, just so I can plug in at a nerd level, what I'm very excited about is, um, you know, in this new world of AI, it's not about programming languages as it was in the old day of software. It's about models and frameworks. And so one of the things that is a total has been totally breakthrough is GPT-3, not to plug it again, but GPT-3 has totally changed the way we can think about, you know, predicting the future of language and getting language replies from computers in a semi-automated, very automated way. But I think that's actually beginning to happen. We're seeing it in not all of biology, but we're seeing it in specific areas. So for example, in um, blood cancers or hematopoietic cancers or in certain solid tumors or immunological response, we're seeing frameworks being built that have you know, literally millions and millions and millions of variables, but very specific sets of data attached to predict how these variables will change. And so we we'll begin to see GPT-3-like structures for specific disease areas beginning to emerge. And that's very exciting because I think that will really transform our understanding. Well, let, let's hope that the, uh, the, the future looks the way we're envisioning. I mean, to me, what, one of the challenges always seems to be that there's the, the, we're, it's always presented. I just heard this terrific uh, podcast with the former CMO of um, AbbVie, right? Um, and used to be at Amgen, um, you're talking almost exactly along the same lines. And so on the one hand, you have this idea of um, there needs to be cheaper drugs, there needs to be this better, and then there's this incredibly powerful technology, but it still doesn't mean it's gonna work. And figuring mm -hmm. out how to make that work is, is clearly the opportunity everyone's responding to. So I'm so happy there are people like both of you uh, and working on this, that there's a field working on this. I'm, I'm uh, really optimistic about how things are heading. I, even though I really uh, think there has to be much more emphasis on implementation, figuring out how to get all this exciting technology to work. On that note, thank you both for joining us today uh, and uh, best of luck going forward. David, thank you. Lena, thank you. Good meeting you as well. Thank you both. Thanks for the interesting discussion.